Hey everyone, I'm Chris Ronzio and this is Organized Chaos. So for anyone that's tuning in for the first time, before starting Trainual, I had a consulting firm actually called Organized Chaos. And what we did was work with growing businesses to solve their systems and processes challenges. And that's what we're going to do here today. So let's get into it. Dave, thanks for joining us. Hey, thanks. appreciate you having me on. Cool. So for everyone that's watching, why don't you just tell them uh, what's your business and what do you guys do? All right. So um, I'm a I'm a real estate investor and we started uh, we decided to start a new tech property tech startup uh, and take technology uh, to the next level in real estate investing. And our venture is called ExitNest.com. It's the world's first cash home buyer search engine. So just cool. like it's, it's like Kayak or Expedia, if you want to sell your home, you enter your information one time, we give you dozens of uh, cash offers and an easy to read side by side comparison. Awesome. All right. So for anyone that doesn't know the wholesale home buying market, I guess just a quick intro to this is that when people buy properties, they're, they can buy them from a realtor that are listed on the MLS, or you can buy them off market, right? As an investment. Do you, and, and, and so what's your experience in, in that business? So I used to be uh, one of the owners in Phoenix uh, with We Buy Ugly Houses. I was one of the top 20 producing uh, franchise, franchises in the nation uh, in Phoenix, Arizona. Um, and so we, as I met with homeowners, distressed and motivated homeowners, they all had the same pain, like which which investor do I sell to? Who, which one's right for me and my situation? And, uh, and, and it's a lot of work to figure out which investor is going to pay them the best amount or is going to solve their problem in the, the way that makes the most sense for them and their unique individual situation. Okay, got it. So I'm curious with Exit Nest, is it a marketplace where the homeowner is finding investors or the investors finding homeowners or is it just one way? Um, so there, there's, there's, we have, a we're, we're starting, we're trying to say MVP and just say, focus on our, our main thing, but it, it can get, uh, we do have a couple other features. The main objective is if you're, if you're a homeowner looking to sell your house direct and not use a realtor, come to our platform and enter your information one time and we'll introduce you to all of the in different investors. Okay. So the value you're providing is the huge network of investors. Sure. And just the ease and convenience of it. So maybe you don't know um, who's right for you or which one to go with. And there's all of these new companies that are coming out. So kind of the catalyst for this is the iBuyer market. Okay. So you have Open Door, OfferPad, Zillow Instant Offers, um, along with there's about a dozen other ones. Sunday.com is, uh, is a new one that's, uh, that's buying in Phoenix. Um, and there's, there's about... Uh, you know, 12 others in different stages of raising money and starting to buy houses. Sparrow now buys houses, easy knock, easy knock will buy your house and lease it back, lease option it back to you. Hmm, um, interesting. And a lot, of, so that might solve your problem. If you don't know that easy knock will buy your house and so you can sell it today and they'll lease it back to you and you can stay there for up to five years. That might be a much better solution for you than selling your house for cash to open door and having to move out. So is exit nest a, a alternative to those or is it an aggregator where like a lending tree you're farming business to all of those people yeah we're just an aggregator so we won't we don't Got buy it. your house um i used to buy houses but now i just want to be a true fiduciary and help you uh figure out which buyer's best for you and nice. lend all my expertise and help that consumer just because a consumer has some type of trauma or stress in their life I don't feel like they should have to be punished by taking a discount on their equity. Like maybe, yeah. maybe they lost their job, you know, maybe, maybe somebody died, maybe somebody got cancer and they're, they're distressed. And then all of these uh, cash buyers and investors are trying to go and, and buy it, buy it cheap and take advantage of that situation. I want to help protect them to figure out who's going to take the best care of them with, sure. with true, with true transparency. Okay. So you're on their side. You're fighting for the best deal for them. How does your business make money? Like what's the economic model? So we charge a 1% acquisition fee to whoever buys the house. And we, okay. so we don't mark it up. We don't, we don't sell the contract or reassign it. Um, we, we just, 
introduce them to the end and we ask for a 1% acquisition fee to the end buyer. Which, which if which anyone is, knows the real estate wholesale market is very low for normally when you're handing off deals like that, they get marked up a lot more. Which is probably, which is one of our biggest challenges and problems because it, it's, it's tough to get this message out for less than our acquisition fee, than, than our acquisition fee. Our, our, our acquisition cost is, is higher than, than what our fee is. Okay, so so let's talk about that. The the acquisition cost for you is the cost to find the property, right? To find the the buyer or the the seller, the homeowner, right? Yeah, it's super expensive because these real estate investors make twenty, thirty, forty thousand dollars on a house, so they can afford to spend six, seven thousand dollars in marketing to get one deal. Right, and, and if so, you're only charging a one percent acquisition fee, you've got a lot smaller value of a customer that you can use to go market and find them. So you need to really do it at scale. We need to do it at scale. Which is our, that's our goal is to go nationwide with this and, and to be in, uh, you know, all of the major markets in the United States and, and disrupt the wholesaling, the wholesaling industry. So, so the competitors are not necessarily competitors, but kind of the vertically integrated partners like the open doors and offer pads, they have massive marketing budgets to go get these customers direct. And you're trying to be this layer, almost like a, uh, like a credit karma or mint suggests credit cards, right? You're like providing this utility to the customer in hopes that you can hand off deals to different partners and make something on the, on the back end. but you also need to do it at scale. So what have you done for marketing so far? We keep trying all kinds of different things. So we're always iterating and we're, we're trying to figure out the right fit. So we're tr we've tried social media marketing where we've tried direct mail. Um, we've done, uh, we've, we've done postcards and um, uh, that, that's, that's about the gist of it. You know, we did some, some, so we did some billboards. We did some blip billboards, digital billboards. Um, so it's, geographically, it's, where are you targeting? Well, right now we're we're just based in Phoenix, so we're trying to get all this stuff to scale. We're doing beta in Florida um, Why right now, but uh, because Florida is growing so much and it's um, it's such a big market, there's so many large markets within Florida. Okay, um, so but there's a lot of properties to sell. Yeah, and there's a lot of success in this. A lot of the motivated sellers, the snowbird markets, Arizona's really strong. Because you have so many old people retiring, and pe and their and people's parents are dying, or going into homes, or coming back home. That there's yeah. there's a lot a lot of people that and the older snowbirds tend to own their home for cash, and they're not as worried about um, top dollar. They're they're more interested in the convenience of it. So, so I like that you're focusing geographically um, and also sort of situationally, like um, for Trainual, for instance, when we launched, we weren't just a system for everyone to use. We were a system for people that were using Google Docs to try to do training at scale. And so a lot of our early messaging and marketing was around like, are you trying to do this with Google Docs? Well, here's a better way because we had this persona of somebody that has a very specific need, like they need a better way to deliver their training and and now that's changed as the business has changed but that was kind of our entry point into the market so for you the snowbird personality would you know if if you're trying to be everything to everyone your marketing is going to fall flat whereas if you're the exit nest and it's branded with like here's here's a snowbird landing in the exit nest you know and it's like right. this is what we do is we help this customer um it lets you fine tune a lot the who you're going after which reduces your cost of acquisition and that at least it did for us um and then the other thing geographically like you're competing against people that are doing this with a billion dollars in funding or whatever you know? we, we know yeah we're going like in phoenix uh you know these i buyers are running a two million dollar a month budget right yeah, like and so and but if you're up against that you've got to be completely different like either either you've got to be geographically different like you're serving the underserved rural areas that they don't put billboards up or you're serving the secondary cities that they're not launching in or or your persona is is different than who they're going after because then then they can identify more with your company when they're not really sure if this big thing is for them. Because I, I know my concern with like those other products is exactly what you hit on, that I'm gonna have to take a 10% lower value 
on my house to make this transaction easy. And if I could come to you and you say, well, that's not the case. We're going to protect you because there's a ton of people that want to buy your house. And yeah. it might be that, you know, you might not have to give up that much. Then that's a that's a value to me. you're on my side, you know, so so you just need to insert yourself into the, the conversation. So you said you had done. Uh, direct mail and some social media. What's what's worked so far? Like, what have you gotten? Well, what, what's actually worked is uh, is text messaging and ringless voicemails to like people that are are for sale by owners is what's worked the best. But they're they're okay. constantly changing these rules and laws with all of this stuff with opening the phone systems. You know, um, uh, all these rules that are changing with, with telemarketing right now and being able to use robo dialers and be able to, to do this stuff, um, and text, text blasting, text blasting, like there, there's all these rules constantly changing. Uh, so that's, those were unforeseen when we started this, those were kind of unforeseen, uh, challenges that we weren't as well as prepared for. So getting our message out is the big, is the big challenge and telling people that there's a search engine. Um, mm -hmm. so what we're probably doing now, our next move is we're going to switch to an SAAS model and offer this software out to realtors so that realtors can showcase and teach a motivated homeowner. Some homeowners don't want to sell their house on the market. Uh, we bought houses simply because they wanted privacy. Um, we bought, we bought houses for so many weird reasons. Uh, that people didn't want to sell with the realtor. I bought a house one time because uh, the guy's wife could not keep the house clean and couldn't fold the laundry. She couldn't keep the laundry off the front, the living room couch. And so he's like, I'll just sell it at a discount because I'm not having this fight with my wife. So, but if you're, but if people don't want realtors, why would you partner with realtors? They just, it's not that they don't want realtors. It's just that they don't want to deal with showings, mm. right? Like they, they want to sell it. They want to sell it and they want as much money for their house, but they don't necessarily want to, they can't keep it clean. I, we, we bought a, a house from a guy that had, that had Doberman Pinscher attack dogs, like Magnum PI style, style Zeus and Apollo. And he's like, I can't show my house and I'm not going to kennel my dogs for, for three months. So I'll take, I'll take a discount. You know, so, so why don't you, I mean, like that's a situation though, that you've identified that you could market around. You know, you could, you can say, don't want to lock your dogs in a kennel to show your house for three months. Like we're, we're dog friendly. We'll buy it. No problem. Like, and we send you a, bo a bones, you know, a box of bones in the mail. Like that's your, that's your direct mail thing is like dog biscuits. Oh yeah. You know? That's cool. Yeah. That's fantastic. I love that. You know, like, it's like, but, but, but those are the things that get you to stand out where you're not the big spray and pray kind of brand you're like you understand this because you've been in this business for so long you know like that's where same with me like when i'm working with an employee uh, with a with a customer that is trying to build cobble together this this like playbook for their company and i see the intrinsic motivations that are like they want to spend more time at home with their kids or they hate it having to like jump in and do the job because the, this person quit and it wasn't written down and they've got to refigure it out like that's the stuff that is throughout all of our marketing so you have this advantage in being in the industry for so long that you know all those little situational things and that's the stuff to call out in your marketing not the crap everyone else is saying like we'll, we'll buy homes for like, you know, less and real estate investors. And then you're just noise. Right. So yeah, that's, that's good. So our, our goal though, is, is to help, is to help you sell to any, anyone. Right. So there's so many, we, we want to be like kayak or Expedia. And instead of, instead of flights, uh, we, we present cash buyers. Right. Mm -hmm. And, and so there's so many different airlines, right? Like, and, and people go through this process. They think, okay, I want, I want the cheapest flight to, to Miami. And then they get on to, onto their search engine. They find out, holy cow, the cheapest, uh, the cheapest flight is on spirit and it's a red eye and it's 22 hours of travel time with four, four plane changes. And they say, <laughs> oh no, no, no. I don't want the cheapest flight. I want the cheapest direct flight. Right. And then they find out that that's 1400 bucks and they're like, well, that's out of my budget. So they go back and they say, well, can I get one stop for $400? And they go through that process. So, we find it's the same thing with, with people with, with homeowners wanting to sell their house. I want as much money for my house as I can get. 
okay, well then you should probably redo your kitchen and master bathroom and list it with a realtor. Oh no, no, no. Yeah. I need as much money for my house in three weeks as so I can. How about, something, how about something like there's a thousand ways to sell a house. You take the keys, you know, like, right. like you're in the driver's seat, you make the decisions and I haven't been to your, your homepage, but just showing that like, here's all the different filters and ideas and ways that, you know, do you want to sell quickly? Do you want to sell, you know, does privacy matter to you? Do you have pets? Do you have kids? Do you have a weird rental situation? Do you have, you know, in-laws that like, you know, are pack rats and you don't want anybody to see them, you know, like there, there's the, whatever situations you understand, you spell that out and be like, there's thousands of ways to do this. The decision's yours. Um, you know, take back control because actually that's, that's kind of the, 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 thing I think people struggle with is that when you're selling your house, you almost feel like you're going in for a surgery and you have zero control. You know, yeah. you're, you, you sign a contract with the realtor, you cross your fingers every day that they're going to find a buyer or that they know what they're doing with the listing. And I think that the biggest thing you're giving people is that direct control, right? Yeah. So absolutely. how, how, how would you advertise your search engine then? Like how have you copied the the kayak playbook and seen what they did in their early days? Uh, the problem, the challenge with it is, is it's not really kayak, right? It's more Priceline because this is a new concept, right? Like, so when Priceline came out, they didn't tell people, uh, you know, that they were a search engine. They just had like William Shatner running around doing silly commercials, acting like some James Bond guy, you know what I mean? Just creating awareness that there was such a thing that you can name your own price for a flight but yeah. the the challenge is is this the aggregator model has never been applied to the cash to the cash buyer discount motivated seller space and so this concept is new in this in this in this space so that's Where that's, is, that's challenging did i i don't know the answer to this but did priceline have to go out and individually form relationships with all these people to get their exclusive deals or did they tap into some network of existing travel reservation database and they self-finance the discounts or something yeah, do you know i don't know this the specifics of that i mean there's a they they started finding all the they they cut a deal with the vacant flights like with vacant yeah. with empty planes to sell to get them to bid to create an auction almost right like and yeah. submit hey i'll pay 79 bucks and then they would present that to united and united would say yay or nay you know yeah, your biggest Four challenge is scaling offer. quickly because this is a, it sounds like an awesome model, an awesome concept, and you just need to get to scale really fast. And so, yeah, it, it reminds me of like uh, when PayPal started, they gave people $5 to sign up for a PayPal account. Like they just would deposit $5 into your account. I got $10 from Elon Musk back in the day, right? You remember that? Yeah. Yeah. No, yeah. I, and, yeah. And that was a really viral strategy for them to do that. And it got a ton of people to sign up quickly and they had to finance that. So it was expensive, but it, they saw that it was better to put that $5 per person into their account than to put it on some ads at the time, you know, pay-per-click ads at the time. So I wonder if there's something like that for you that, that you can get customers more quickly or get, get scale more quickly. Do you have, how, how big's the database of, of, uh, of, you know, the, because people, when they're joining a marketplace, they want to see that there's some kind of volume. Do you have like a built in volume of listings in your search engine? Yeah. So, so we do. So we, and we also, we are also kind of creating at the same time we've created a marketplace where, when somebody submits their house, if it doesn't fit their, uh, a specific buyer's criteria, um, then we, then it gets deployed out to our network. So we've created a marketplace where we showcase the property and that goes out to, to the investor list. We only present the first probably six offers, but we have a, a network of, you know, about, it's about 17,000 total, about 3,500 are actually involved in real estate investing on a day-to-day -day basis. But we only showcase about the first six or six or seven because they, they tend to get pretty discounted because these guys normally buy pretty discounted properties. And um, we, we just showcase the top ones. But it's interesting from a marketing standpoint to say you've got X thousand 
you know, investors, like, you know, so we, we've got this many investors that could buy your house. It makes me feel like, yeah, let's see who's going to give the best price. Right. And the best deals are the eye buyer. So a, a, the low hanging fruit and the deals that we're having the most success with are, are procuring deals and helping people understand and hold their hand with offer pad or open door or Zillow instant offers because the, they're unrepresented sellers. Uh, even though Zillow is is a brokerage and Open Door and Offer Pad are brokerages, they do not represent the. If you're a seller, you're not represented. So there's a lot of people that want to sell to them, but they need they just need somebody to give them a gut check and hold their hand and say, "Hey, this is a fair deal. It's okay." But they can't afford a realtor. If the realtor comes in and does it, it just takes it, it takes too much of the margin away. It cuts into their into their net number so much. So we're that uh, disinterested third party that just helps you decide and tells you, hey, this is a fair deal. This is a good deal. You probably only get 10 or 15 grand more if you sold it with a realtor and went through and, and you painted it and you fixed it up. You're only going to get X amount more. This is okay to do. Could you but position as could you position as kind of like the the, the sellers, uh, you know, I don't know, liaison or something where, where we guarantee you'll get a better deal working with us than going direct to one of these companies because we're going to shop them against each other. Right. So, and that's what we're looking at. We're probably going to do and maybe offer some type of a guarantee or some bonus, you know, if we can't, or I, mm -hmm. we, ha we have to figure that out. The other challenge is, is that they don't like it that we have. The iBuyers do not like this. They don't like being, they don't want to compete against each other. They don't like the fact that, uh, that we're, we're telling their clients that there's all these other guys that will buy their house too. And so they're frustrated with us. You know, we, 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 we've been fighting cease and desist. They don't like what's going, that we're doing this. They don't want to compete against each other. And well, who, uh, who would want innovative, disruptive competition? Like, <laughs> <laughs> of course, no one wants that. But that's, <laughs> that's how it is. Like when when people had to go and get a mortgage on their own by talking to 10 different banks versus going to a lending tree or or whatever, you know, like that. Nobody likes that model because it's driving price down with increased transparency. But you win in that model. So, you know, it, it, it like then someone if they don't like it enough, they can acquire you, you know, but, 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 or you get funded and become this very neutral, very highly trusted middle person, you know? Um, but that's, that's, a, that's natural. So I, I, I would figure out how you can make them like you, you know, by, yeah. by, I don't, I don't know if you can do it by, uh, you know, it's almost almost like Yelp does with like featured. You, you want to be highlighted on our site? You're like, let's make it an advertising partnership. And if you do that, more of a percentage of people that come through us will go to you. And um, yeah, I don't know. That's, that's kind of where we're going with it. Again, we got to stay focused on our MVP and we got we got to get more traction. We got to get our revenue up so that we can raise <clears throat> raise money to go. Um, so our, our revenue is just not as consistent, which is one of the other reasons why um, we want to roll this out to realtors as a, as a subscription model. So they, cause the realtors should be showcasing this and telling people that they can give cash offers. If they're not telling them, um, Hey, we have multiple investors, then they're probably not doing their, their job. This, this deal that, um, that Keller Williams and offer pad just cut is super puzzling to me because it seems like a breach in in fiduciary responsibility. If a Keller Williams uh, agent presents an, an offer pad offer because they cut a deal with offer pad and doesn't present an open door and a Zillow instant offer and a Sunday offer and six other cash offers, uh, they're not doing their job, especially if one of those guys will pay more for that house. Hmm. That, to me, that's super problematic that, that the realtor's job is to showcase all of the options and present them all and to just cut a deal with one guy and say, Hey, we're just going to, we're just going to show you all this one guy's offers that that's an issue. And that mm -hmm. that's not a fiduciary. And so we, we think that our service is super beneficial to realtors to be able to present all of the, all of the data 
to a homeowner and let the homeowner know, hey, you have dozens and dozens of choices. So you could go two ways with this. Like realtors are marketing locally, hyper locally to find sellers, right? Because they that that drives their business. And these big companies like OfferPad and Open Door are are marketing very broadly to find sellers. But if you can go to the realtors and let them do the seller marketing, and you just need to get to realtors and say, hey, there's another way to sell your house, you know, uh, your your properties present this option to your customers and we'll, you know, you still take your commission on the transaction. Plus we give you a thousand dollars or something like right. that. Yeah. Um, or, or they, or they can use our software, right? Like kind of, if you go to the, to the travel analogy, right, this would be like software for travel agents. Well, we, there's also, we also have a consumer direct model, right? Where consumers that don't want an, a travel agent can just book their own flight. Um, or, this would be the backend software that the agents use to be able to showcase all of the different options. Yeah. So, and we could, and we could just do it as a subscription model where they, they pay a monthly, a monthly fee uh, with maybe a success fee. Um, I would advise against doing all of them at once though. You know, you've got to, you've got to pick your, what's the, the fastest to scale s solution. You there? Well, this, yeah, I'm here. The, you got me. The fastest yeah. to scale solution um, is the at the end of the day, the real everybody generally calls the realtor, um, whether they decide to go with them or not go with them. It is where people start. Um, so it makes sense for them to be able to have these options. What happens is a lot of these realtors are intimidated with the disruption of iBuyers. They don't like it. And so they want to ignore it instead of embracing it. And so so they're losing trust of the consumer and then the cons they're like, Oh, they're going to rip you off. And then the consumer goes out and finds out Zillow instant offers or offer pad or open door will pay uh, a very competitive offer. Mm -hmm. And, and so the realtors are, are losing that trust with, with the homeowners by not acknowledging this and getting on board with it and providing these options. Uh, you know, open, open doors bought over 50,000 houses online. But but isn't part of their pitch that you're kind of cutting out the realtor and the commissions that you'd pay to the realtor are part of how they're justifying the lower price of the sale? Um, yeah, that's, that's kind of, that's kind of a misnomer a little bit. I mean, a little bit. So they, they, they still pay a fee because they have customer acquisition costs, right? So they, so they, that's why our model is the way it is, is, is the I buyers pay us a 1% that's their model. They'll pay us 1% as a referral to bring them a deal. Yeah. Uh, so, so the agents can do this as well as, com as collect the 1% and not have any additional cost to the homeowner. And uh, it's a lot less work for them. They don't have to work. If, if they're, if they're normally at 3%, it's a lot less work. And so it, the 1% is fair. So, and their, and their price stays the same because now there's, there's less marketing costs and less customer acquisition costs for the, for, you know, for the, for the home buyer. Yeah. Okay. So, so I think we've, we've flushed out the opportunity and we're kind of in brainstorm mode, but I want to nail down on like a couple of <laughs> okay. questions that if you had to ask a couple questions that I could, you know, share experiences on, what do you want to cover? How, how did you decide on your pricing on, on, on with Trenual? on your, uh, and, and how did you decide how to break it out? And, um, I'm not on there, but it doesn't seem like, you, um, how, how did you break it out and model it? Sure. So it was very simple when we launched and my pricing was market-based. So I looked at the audience of small business owners that were, you know, kind of 10 to 50 or a hundred employees. That was where we focused initially. And we said, what are those companies spending on related tools? What do they spend on their project management system? What do they spend on their invoicing system? What do they spend on, you know, X, Y, and Z? And that like 50 to $150 price point is kind of where everything came out. And so for us, launching was let's just be kind of the pricing they'd expect. So we went, we had a $49 plan, we had a $99 plan and we had a $149 plan. So I thought let's, let's launch with 
pricing that they feel is appropriate. And then let's see what people pick the most. And our pricing's changed a lot since we started. Sure. Um, but you've got to start, I think, with the fewer choices, the better, so that you don't overcomplicate it and confuse people. Ooh. And small, small, medium, large. <laughs> right. Yeah. You, 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 uh, and, and that's what it was. It was like up to 25 employees, I think, and then up to a hundred employees and up to 250 were our, were our buckets. And then as customers were signing up, we were collecting the intelligence from them and saying, does this feel too cheap or, you know, we're not going to change your price, but is this expensive? Is this really affordable? And as we heard what they thought of our price and then what they really wanted, we adjusted it several times. So there, there was, you know, there was a time when everyone was buying our $49 plan because we saw that on the first day, no one's adding more than the 25 people to their account. So they're like, let me just start here. There was no distinction of features. And so, you know, months later, years later, we changed it to where now there's a premium package that's got a different set of features from the pro package and you're buying more on this feature decision. But I think initially you want to keep your price really simple. Gotcha. And then, and then where, where did you start with on your, on your marketing? So marketing was, you know, first it was inner circle, like, for, you know, we had a local event, invite a bunch right. of people and it was very geographically focused. We're in Scottsdale, Arizona, and uh, like 80% of our customers in month one were in the greater Phoenix area. And right. then we launched on a site called Product Hunt, which features applications. And then we started an affiliate program and did a, a big blast out to my network, my LinkedIn network of a couple thousand people. Um, that got us just uh, some this, this next ring of like word of mouth traffic. And then as we had more traffic coming to the site, we had more signups and we finally had a sample size of a couple hundred accounts that was big enough that we could start to fine tune what positions and job titles are, are these people. And let's try to target them with social media. So then the next big wave was learning Facebook ads and finding like, how do we target these people first by interest? And then based on the people that are buying from us engaging the most. So marketing is constantly changing at every level, but the biggest growth spike for us was when we found the, the customer on Facebook that was signing up and sticking. And then we just said, how do we get a thousand more of them? And we just kept spending on that channel. So it's, it, that was the big inflection point for the business. And I don't know what that is for you. That might be, you know, if you, if you see that your deals through realtors are your best deals, um, because you can't do the texting thing at scale, then you might say, well, we need to get a thousand realtors in the next three months. And that's, that's our big target. And that's all we're going to do is get relationships with a thousand realtors. And that might not create any business in the next three months, but you know that if you have that done, that sets you up for the quarter after that to do a huge push with the inventory, you know? Yeah. yeah. So we're, we're problematic with some uh, some of our challenges, for instance, in real estate with affiliate, like we, we've been building out this affiliate and we're trying to like, you know, uh, go through, uh, navigate how to do this. And we're separate. We're just a tech company, you know, and to, but there are rules on uh, paying a commission, like an affiliate fee in real estate. It's uh, it has significant challenges, um, but we do have uh we do have kind of an affiliate program that we can work with with some of our cash buyers, right? Because they're direct buyers that they can pay, they can pay somebody that brings them a deal as like yeah. a bird dog fee. Um, but with the with the real estate companies, the in the big eye buyers, uh, it, it's against it's against the it's against the law right now. Yeah, they so have, the economics will be it will be different for you. But you know the 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 real thing was that we we tested a bunch of different things. We found one thing that was working, and we hit the gas pedal on that thing. And so, you know, the, there's, uh, there's this, a book called uh, Blitz Scaling by the guy that started LinkedIn. Have you ever heard of that? Okay. It's called Blitz Scaling uh, yeah. by, by uh, Reed Hoffman, uh, who started LinkedIn. 
awesome book. And, and what you'd see in that is, you know, it's very the same thing. It's like, once you've got the industry expertise and you kind of understand the model and you've got a few success stories and you understand the key value that people are getting from using your service and where you fit in the market, then you want to go pedal to the metal all in on scaling that. Because if you just do a little organic scaling, somebody else is going to take that opportunity. Yeah, which is where we're at right now. So this is, you know, this this is evolving, and there's there's so as as i buyers and the and the e commerce and real estate uh, worlds merge right now and disrupt. Um, there's several other companies trying to do what we what we're doing, and so velocity to market is is pretty important to us. Yeah. So I think if you're especially if you're bootstrapping this, only simple scales, right? Like right. you've got to have like a very black and white model that is like, here's, here's who we're trying to acquire either customers or agents or something like that. Here's the, the one way we get paid and we need to do that a thousand times or 10,000 times. And that's what we're all focused on. Because if you get into this, like, you know, we take 1% here, we charge a thousand dollars here. We work direct with these customers here. Um, you'll, you'll be spread really thin and you, you can't really do all of that at once. You know, like we failed at this. We, we, um, we were getting customers. We were scaling really well. And then I got distracted with a couple uh, white label opportunities. Uh -huh. And they were like, hey, I've got a big channel. I want a white label trainual. I sold five of these things of people that were going to slap a different logo on trainual and sell it as if it didn't exist to their audience. And I probably burned three months because of how excited I was on that white label thing yeah. and took our eye off the direct acquisition. And then finally we shut that down and we were like, nope, we're the brand. People are going to find out about us. And, you know, you can be an enterprise account and get the features you want, but it's trainual. Um, so, so, you know, I, I think the focus for where you're at is, is super key. Yeah. I got that. What, what did you do? And how did you solve your development challenges in the, in the beginning and figuring out developers and making it affordable and, and fun and functional at the same time. <laughs> right. So, so, uh, you know, you, I don't know if you've heard the, the transition story from organized chaos to trainual, but we had an in-house developer, full-time developer. And so we had a lot of the skills in-house that we needed. And we really went through this few month sprint to rebuild and recreate what Trainual was so that it could be launched publicly. And when we did that, we, we hit the brakes. You know, we built a product that was working for at the time, you know, 20 and then 50 and then 150 companies. And my thought was like, yeah, I want to continue developing this thing, but I don't have the cash to continue to develop this thing. So let me get a thousand customers as quickly as possible and then the development is easy to fund you know so so yeah. i think i think you like the simpler you can make the product it's got to do what you're promising you know and our thing did what we were promising it was great for training if you had a really simple training distribution need and because we were solving that simple problem and it was working for enough customers that the economics made sense. We were like, that's it. We're not, we're not gonna like, thank you for all of the features suggestions, but we'll get to those next year. <laughs> and that's what you gotta do, right? Yeah. I remember being so frustrated when like the first iPhone came out. I was like, are you kidding me? Like, it doesn't have all this, it doesn't have video in it yet. Like the first iPhone didn't have all these features. I was like, why wouldn't they do that? Like, I'll just wait for the, the other one. Now that I'm building a startup, I realize MVP, you got to stay focused and you can, you can only do so much at a time and you, you just take it to market and you do what you can. Then you add more features, more features. Yeah, later. And, and it's funny because a lot of businesses will start out and they'll point to the legacy example of whatever the horrible product in the market is. And they want to create something that's better than that thing all around. And so they create something simple that's better than that thing. And then they get so focused on the features and making their product so much better than this thing that they don't put enough emphasis on customer acquisition and marketing and sales. And then they can't compete. They run out of money because they were tinkering with the product. And so I think it's important that you narrow down on some core 
difference and some core customer solve solve a simple problem for a select customer. And if you do that, then focus on scale, get your marketing and sales in order to the point that now you've got this big base of customers and economically it makes sense to invest in the product because you don't want the customers to churn. You know, so there's there's this game you're always playing on, like, how much do I invest in product and features? And you have to not forget about the acquiring customers because the, the, the simple product still sells. Yeah. Well, that's why we want, to, we want to go to the subscription model is a lot of people only sell a house a couple times in their whole life. Right. So we, we don't have it's not really very recurring, you know, and then and then we're running transactional. And so it's really hard to budget, right? Our, our growth. So we have a great month and then we have a slow month and we think it's going to keep going and it, and it, it's a, it cycles and kind of moves up and down because it's so, it's so transactional. So adding so what the- What other services do realtors pay for? Oh, in, insurance, mar marketing. Um, On a subscription basis, what else do they pay for? Uh, I mean, their MLS access to deals, right? Access to the- are you MLS, selling to um, direct to realtors or are you selling to brokerages? We're probably going to go to the brokerages and sign up. We, we haven't done this yet. This is our newest pivot as we, our iterations and, and experience in the marketplace has told us this. Plus they're, they're using it for free anyways. So I, I started networking and rolling this out. We went to some conferences and we got all of this uh, spike of traction and uh, traffic on our website. And what we started looking at it, what was happening is realtors were coming they're getting our side-by-side -side comparison and then they're taking it to listing appointments and using it to showcase and tell the homeowner what everybody would pay for. And then we were just doing it all for free. Right. Mm -hmm. And then they would, then they would circumvent us. Um, and so that's, that's a challenge too, as a search engine, right? People do this. Like you'll go to kayak or Expedia or whatever your search engine is and you'll check a flight and you'll go like, let me just go and check Delta real quick or United real quick and just double check. And you might, end up booking on either one for whatever reason, right? So mm -hmm. we're, we're creating a lot. So people come to our site and then leave our site and they want to, they, they don't necessarily understand that we're, we're totally transparent or they're skeptical that that's what's going on. And so uh, some of these buyers are frustrated because they have double leads now because mm -hmm. they don't know what to work with because the homeowners uh, applied directly to, to the cash buyer. Yeah. And then Exit Nest, they, they did it through Exit Nest, which Exit Nest applied through the iBuyer at the same time. And so that that causes some disruption and, and frustration, uh, you know, for, for the iBuyers. Well, good news for you is it's a messy market. There's yeah. there's a there's a lot in transition and there's a lot of opportunity. So the hardest thing is going to be picking one of these directions to stick with. So if you know, if a subscription product to real estate brokerages is the current idea, then I would say go all in on testing that idea and set some measurable goals and say, you know, we want to, we want to price something really cheap for a brokerage and maybe it's $50 a month or $10 a month or hundred dollars a month or whatever, based on how many brokerages there are in the U S or whatever your market is. And, you know, you, you're, you're marketing this, this, ever-changing database of cash buyers that on average get this kind of value from a house and move things this much faster. And it's like, you know, you're arming the realtor and the brokerage with this, this pool of buyers that is instantly accessible and keeps them in the loop so that the cust their customer is not going direct to one of these these uh, big companies. And if you can make that your core product and sell it for one simple price and make your measurement of success, can we get a hundred brokerages or realtors or whatever in the next two months? Like do that and just don't give up on it and don't do anything else because that, that would be like your current experiment or iteration, but you've got to go all in on that. Like an example of that for us, we, in our first uh, couple months, we were signing up a lot of uh, accounts and I mentioned we went through and looked at everyone's titles and we saw that the titles of the people that were most active in the system were these HR generalist, you know, like uh, people uh, type positions. And so we thought, Eureka, we found it. Like, let's market to those people. And then we marketed to those people for the next 60 days and our sales tanked. 
And then we found out, okay, those weren't the buyers, but those are the users. The buyer is a different yeah. persona. It, but you've got to do these experiments with enough time and enough money and like a sample size to make a decision so that it's not just like you're changing direction every day. Right. What, uh, what are your favorite besides Trinual? What are your favorite uh, tech tools or apps that you're using these days? Cause that, that was one of my favorite things about you is you're, you're plugged into the, the best efficiency <laughs> uh, apps and tech. What are, what are your favorite ones that you're using besides, besides Trinual? <laughs> Man, so good question. Um, Slack, I'm on all day, every day, and it's got a lot of cool plugins that we use. Mm -hmm. ProfitWell is a tool that plugs into our Stripe account for all of our charges. So anyone that's creating a SaaS business and it sounds like you're on that path, ProfitWell will show you all the metrics of how long customers pay you a subscription before they cancel, what your average value of a customer is, and it's really helpful when you're building out your funnel. So a huge fan of that. Um, Let's see. Headspace. I meditate a lot. I, 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 I've been on Headspace too. It's been so hard for me to get into the, into the habit of meditating and it feels a little corny at first, you know, you feel a little <laughs> doing affirmation. It's important though. It's important. No, I feel, I feel better. And it's, it, it's, uh, I do like it for sure. I've been using Headspace too. Yeah. Yeah. So it's funny. I'll have to do a roundup of apps because I feel like it's, it's, changed a lot. I was so plugged in uh, when I was consulting and working with a lot of companies. Right. And now I'm just like looking at dashboards and reports and marketing stuff. So, um, all right, let's do any other, like a last question before we wrap this up. Uh, what, what's, uh, what, what's the number one book you, you recommend right now to, to For anybody you? or your, or your favorite, or your favorite recent, most favorite recent book you read? Um, I'm reading, this is a super old recommendation, but I'm reading uh, Simon Sinek, Start With Why right now. Um, I've seen his videos on YouTube and everything, but yeah. I'd never read the book. And so I'm in the middle of that and it's been really thought provoking. So I read or listen to audiobooks when I run, which is I think like a, a super hack to get podcasts and audiobooks in while you're doing some endurance stuff because it's right. like strategic planning every, every single day. Um, yeah. so, so more so than reading, I would say the audio like, do, audible, do something active and yeah. in, ingest. Cool. All right. Awesome. Any last, last burning question? No, that's it. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. All right. This was fun. So if, uh, if you're in the market to sell your house, check out exit nest and look at their aggregating, uh, search engine of properties that a cash buyer can come and make the process easy for you. Um, if, uh, if you want uh, any other questions about real estate or starting a business in that, reach out to Dave. Um, of course I am Chris Ronzio from Trainual. So check us out if you're building the playbook for your business and we'll see you next time on Organize Chaos. Thanks everyone.